I'm Mary Lloyd Ireland. I'm an orthopedic surgeon and practice at the University of Kentucky. Contact information is down below. We do have a university YouTube channel and I also have a personal website that is MaryLloydIreland.com. This and other narrated videos will be on that website as well as the PDF. This talk is on hand and wrist diagnosis and imaging. I have nothing to disclose. There's no relevant financial relationships to be discussed directly, indirectly, referred to or illustrated with or without recognition within this presentation. This is what we'll go through in this PowerPoint. Differential diagnosis, plain x-rays, scaphalonic disassociation, imaging, scaphoid fractures, hamate fractures, and then show some hand injuries, x-rays, and making the diagnosis of the hand. The most important and key to correct diagnosis is always the history, physical, and good plain radiographs. When you're dealing with small bones and joints in the hand and the wrist, it's very important to get good x-rays, sometimes cone x-rays, sometimes marked x-rays over the bone that you're concerned about. Is it a wrist sprain or not? You've got to make the diagnosis. Wrist sprains do exist. However, the injuries and diagnoses you don't want to miss are a scaphoid fracture, hamate fracture, scaphalunate disassociation. You don't want to miss those diagnoses. If a wrist continues to hurt, particularly if it's in the snuff box, then you've got to think about a scaphoid fracture and make the diagnosis by repeat x-rays, repeat exam, and possible other imaging such as CT or MR. Wrist sprains do exist. Don't miss scaphoid fractures, carpal instability, hook of the hamate. Certain tendinopathies are common in athletes, such as a ulnar-sided wrist pain in a tennis athlete of extensor carpi ulnaris tendinitis. Weightlifters can have an intersection, tenosynovitis, de Quervain's first dorsal compartment. If missed, the athlete will develop chronic wrist problems and perhaps disability and inability to do work with upper extremity. The physical exam, you can think of this by zones. There are five zones of the wrist, radial dorsal, central dorsal, ulnar dorsal, radial volar, and ulnar volar. So if we think about these zones and the anatomy structures that are in those zones, you can easily make the diagnosis. In the radial dorsal zone, you think about the common ganglion cyst that is typically on the dorsal aspect of the wrist. You can have sensory branch radial nerve irritation. And intersection syndrome, which is common in weightlifters or somebody doing repetitive forearm work, is a friction between the extensor pollicis brevis and the abductor pollicis longus. There'll be a squishy sensation at the muscle tendon junction there and perhaps localized swelling. Also in the radial dorsal zone, if we think about the bones, the scaphoid lives there, the radial styloid. Scaphoid will be in the snuff box and the radial styloid problems will be a little more proximal. You can have arthritis at the first carpometacarpal joint or the basilar joint. Tenosynovitis of that first dorsal compartment, de Quervain's tenosynovitis. De Quervain's tenosynovitis is a inflammation of the tendon and sheath of the extensor pollicis brevis, abductor pollicis longus, which are in the first dorsal compartment. Shown in red here is where the patient would hurt. Injections can be done, steroid creams can be used, and splints are the treatment for this. The diagnosis is clinical. The patient points to this specific spot. An x-ray is necessary 
to rule out any problems in the wrist, particularly a scaphoid problem, but you can see, as highlighted here, the problem is more along where the tendon is running and not really in the snuff box, which I'm pointing to there. So it's not the snuff box, it's more the first dorsal compartment of a tenocinnabitis. This is a clinical exam of where they hurt. You can see where that is proximal to the scaphoid. Sometimes there'll be some localized swelling. If you are going to do an injection in someone that has more pigment, you do have to warn them that they could have depigmentation and loss of some of the subcutaneous fat in that area before you do an injection. This individual was having an injection done for tenocinnabitis of the first dorsal compartment or de Quervain syndrome. The central zone, think about Kindbox disease, again a ganglion cyst, scaphalunate ligamentous injury, and a capitate problem. If you go on the radial volar zone, the scaphoid tuberosity, palpate that for pain, flexor carpi radialis tendonitis, again where the tendon attaches, you follow the tendon to that insertion and they should hurt in the direction that the tendon is running. The median nerve, very commonly carpal tunnel syndrome is seen, and they would have a positive tenels over that. And also think about the vascular test of an Allen's test to see if the radial and ulnar arteries are competent or if there are some anatomic variation. The ulnar dorsal zone, distal radial ulnar joint instability, triangular fibrocartilaginous tear, ulnar impaction syndrome, fracture of the hook of the hamate and the pisiform. The hook of the hamate fracture would hurt more over the volar aspect. The ulnar dorsal zone, lunotriquetral instability, extensor carpi ulnaris instability, strain, tendonitis, which we see more often in a racket-type sport, such as tennis. The ulnar volar zone, arthrosis, piezotriquetral fracture of the hamate, ulnar nerve compression. You can have a volar wrist ganglion. Typically, this is directly over the radial carpal joint, adjacent to the flexor carpi radialis tendon. There can be some size problems when it gets too big. There can be some problems with it being bothersome because of the size of it since it's on the volar aspect. The differential diagnosis of volar wrist pain is radiocarpal arthritis, flexor carpi radialis tendonitis, CMC arthritis. If we think about diagnosis made easy, cysts or masses can occur about the wrist. Typically it is a ganglion. They can be volar or dorsal, more commonly dorsal. You can also have a ganglion off of any of the tendon sheaths or anything that has synovium. You can have a volar retinacular ganglion cyst. Less commonly is a giant cell tumor of the tendon sheath, a mucous cyst of the distal interphalangeal joint, which would be indicative of some underlying osteoarthritis of the distal interphalangeal joint. This is what a dorsal wrist ganglion looks like as outlined in the yellow. It's a mass over the dorsal radial aspect. It can fluctuate in size, like if somebody's weightlifting or using their wrists a lot, then it can get bigger. It often gets more painful if it gets bigger, but it may also be painful if the mass gets to be smaller. Sometimes there is a history of indirect injury. The treatment for this is to watch it, use some type of a compressive wrap, particularly such as tape when you're lifting, aspiration and injection, and a needling of the ganglion cyst walls can be done. Excision of this can be done. Recurrence can be up to 25%, so non-operative management and injection aspiration is suggested.
Diagnosis made easy, compression of a nerve or a tendon. Think of carpal tunnel syndrome, cubital tunnel syndrome, radial tunnel syndrome, the queer veins, and a trigger finger abnormality of that A1 pulley. Carpal tunnel syndrome, the test for this, you can do a Tunnels over the carpal tunnel. You can test for two-point sensation. You can test for weakness, as is shown here in the muscles innervated by the median nerve. Cubital tunnel syndrome, or compression of the ulnar nerve at the elbow, is seen here in the typical ulnar nerve distribution of numbness in the ulnar ring finger and small finger would be seen, as opposed to the median nerve, which would be the other fingers and thumb. Radial tunnel syndrome in the forearm can be mistaken for tennis elbow or lateral humeral epicondylitis, but typically with radial, radial tunnel syndrome, where the radial nerve comes through is six centimeters distal to the lateral humeral epicondyle, and they will have pain directly over that area on palpation and have localized pain in that area and some reproducible pain on doing supination repetitive maneuvers as shown. So think about radial tunnel syndrome or a nerve problem if the pain is a little distal and it's more related to fatigue, but still it would be repetitive supination type activity similar to lateral humeral epicondylitis or tennis elbow. So on the physical exam, know the surface anatomy and location of the structures. On the left is the radial styloid process. So if you have something going on with a distal radius, that's exactly where they'll hurt. They may have a lot of swelling. As opposed to a scaphoid fracture, the pain and where that bone lives is in the anatomic snuff box. Usually they won't have a lot of swelling if it is a stress fracture of the scaphoid. Certainly, if there is a distal radius fracture or a scapholunate disassociation, there will be a significant amount of swelling. So palpate the anatomic snuff box, have the patient raise their thumb up into dorsiflexion, and find the snuff box. If they're painful there, then you should suspect a scaphoid fracture. This is an example of a hematoma on the left. It looks like a fracture. Clinically, you can suspect a soft tissue injury or a fracture, so this would be one for sure that I would get an x-ray on. The x-rays were negative, and this was a fall on an outstretched hand, and he had ecchymosis, a hematoma, in his thenar musculature. On the right is a problem that we see all too often, an infection, and this is a MRSA infection. So just as an example of this isn't a fracture, no real trauma here, had an infection with methicillin-resistant staph aureus. So what about x-rays? Typically, we get an AP lateral and an oblique view are our usual views. If you suspect a specific bone, you can get marked cone views. You can get bilateral views, which are very easy to get and you can compare what the scaphoid or navicular looks like on one side compared to the other. You can have them hold a stress ball and have them go into ulnar deviation and do bilateral stress views. This can tell us if there's a scapholunate instability problem or an asymmetry one side compared to the other. Oftentimes cheerleaders will have loose wrists and if they're symmetrical that's not anything to be concerned about. In sports where they're using their wrist for weight bearing, it is important to make sure we're not missing scapholunate instability. And then a carpal tunnel view where the hand is maximally dorsiflexed is very helpful to look for a hamate fracture on the ulnar aspect of the wrist. Two plain x-ray views 
incorporate the joint above and the joint below may be insufficient to diagnose fractures and dislocations of the hand and wrist. You don't want to get three oblique fractures. You want to get an x-ray that is a PA and a lateral as shown here. There is a fracture of the distal radius that you can see right here on the lateral view. You can see this too, that's a non-displaced fracture of the distal radius, but you can see much better the joint here with this 45 degree oblique view. So you can start out with your regular three views and then get other views which are helpful to see if this is displaced or not. And you can't really see the ulna styloid fracture until you see this view. You can't see it maybe a little bit there, but this oblique view is better. So you can get your regular x-rays first, but then go back and get marked views or different degrees of obliquity to diagnose distal radius and wrist fractures. This is a scaphalunate instability or disassociation. Want to do your, your plain films after you do the x-ray so that you can order the appropriate films, but sometimes you have to send them back. So this is an individual that had a increased distance from the scaphoid to the lunate here, but also had a distal radial styloid fracture this fracture intraarticular, and then you can see this little fracture of the uh, styloid. So this was something that the instability of the wrist needed to be addressed. Remember to get stress views for the evaluation of suspected ligamentous disruption of the hand and wrist. These stress views are good to get both sides and compare the distances between the bones of the wrist. You can see both of these, this is a displaced scaphoid or navicular fracture here. If you have an ulnar styloid fracture, this gives you a clue that there could be something else going on, but you can see here where this displacement also results in instability of the proximal carpal row. And then this is another fracture of the scaphoid with a small fracture coming off the ulnar proximal row as well. Angled views, carpo-metacarpal joints, you can see here these are marked, but this is a great view for the basilar joint. We see a lot of arthritis in the saddle joint, the trapezio-metacarpal joint, this basilar joint. Other joints can also have x-ray changes of fractures or osteoarthritis, but this is a very good angled view to see that basilar joint. The scaphoid, the pisiform is uncovered on a pronated view as shown here. You can see this pisiform on the proximal carpal row, the fourth bone, ulnar side. And then you can also see that little fleck off the scaphoid in this 25 degree pronated view. So that's the direction of this view, pronation of the forearm. The lunate can be seen here. This is a collapse of the lunate and arthritis. Could have been a previous Kindbox disease, but this is the lunate right here. You can measure angles on the lateral view as well. The lunotraquetral ligament can also be injured in certain oblique views, such as this 30 degree pronated view, are good for that. Visi instability, as described by Julio Telesnik. The trapezium can be seen on this hyperpronated view. And this is the trapezoid as shown here in the carpus. So if you suspect by little flecks of bone off here that there is a fracture. You also should suspect that there's a ligamentous injury to the wrist. That would be somebody to be referred to a hand and wrist surgeon.
This is the capitate, a 25-degree caudal view. You can see here where there's a fracture through the mid-waist of the capitate, an unusual injury, but one that you can see with this view. So if you suspect some of the other small bones in the wrist are broken, you may want to consult with your x-ray techs and view some of these special views in textbooks. Also, you could put a little marker on this, a little metallic marker, so you could see if that area where this fractured capitate is indeed where they're hurting. So in conclusion, do a history and physical before imaging studies. Get the appropriate x-rays based on what you feel the diagnosis is. Cone views, oblique views, depending on what joint and bone is involved. Imaging studies may overdiagnose hand disorders, such as an MRI scan can overdiagnose problems, whether it's in the hand or the foot. You must correlate your exam with imaging studies. History and physical overrides imaging. Thanks to Bill Dexter, Portland, Maine, Martin Boyer, Wash U, and Ruben. Gulula, Middleton, Tifi at the Mellon Rott Institute of Radiology for use of some of the slides in this presentation. Waterbuck, the end. Thank you.